Hello and great Monday morning here in Vancouver, British Columbia. My name is Mark Cron, and this is your wake up call. Wow, I gotta say, you know, what a weekend it's been here in Vancouver. Uh, I was been connected with, you know, about 40,000 people from around the globe from 138 countries in the past week. And I'll tell you what, that was a wake up call for me. And about 40,000 other people as we were, uh, we did a virtual event with Tony Robbins. As many of you know, I've been working in the Tony Robbins world for a number of years as part of his leadership team. And because of this whole COVID situation, he brought his Unleash the Power Within uh, to an online virtual audience. And it was quite nothing less than spectacular as there was 22,500 people registered. By the time their family, friends and guests showed up in their homes, we figured there was like 40, 50,000 people that we were waking up around the world. And it was really just an honor and privilege to see how the world is changing, to see how people are acting, reacting, behaving, and to see how Tony, who's a genius in so many different things, was able to, in a very short order of time, put together the largest Zoom seminar conference I think they've ever done with that many people, with that many Zoom rooms, with the 360 degree studio and stadium where you could see everybody. It was nothing less than amazing. And to watch all those beautiful souls wake up and have such a great time playing full out was, uh, was an amazing weekend. And part of that weekend for me too, as many of you know, uh, we have a community home here too. I was, you know, able to also do a, an event at the home with my great friend, Naomi Prema Devi. Now, Naomi is Really, I, I consider her a tantric priestess. I don't know what she'll define herself as as, as we get going. Uh, but I met her a number of years ago at a Tantra festival. And, uh, you know, she's, she's very much into the intimate arts of sacred sexuality, of conscious relating, and all around just, you know, some yogic awesomeness. So, Naomi, welcome to the show today, as we're going to talk about the modern version of Tantra, what it means to uh, be conscious relating and wake up to the reality of our world of sac sacred sexuality um, and our relationships, because relationships are the most powerful driving force of our lives, because we all want love. We all want connection. It's what we're all here for. Mm -hmm. So we're here to wake up that to that today. And uh, Naomi, let's talk Tantra, let's talk conscious relating, let's talk sacred sexuality. Um, but let's first share with our audience, you know, introduce yourself, tell your story, how you got into what it is that you do, because I think you're nothing less than spectacular in the way you host your events. And she had a, a pink poochie here the other day. And uh, that's what I was referring to on the Friday night while I was up here uh, working with Tony. Uh, she was leading a, a beautiful event uh, in another part of our home. So please. Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me on the show today. Hey, my pleasure. Yeah, I'm super excited. And yeah, so I've been in the, I say, Tantra, sacred sexuality world since about 2002, when I actually found Tantra in India. And before that, I'd grown up in New Zealand, where I was, my parents were both meditators and... Um, I always felt connected to the mysteries of life and the sacredness of life. Um, but the thing that was around me at that time was Christianity. So mm. anyway, I got the Christian, what I call the Christian imprint. And I really had this thought that I must wait till after marriage to have sex and that to be spiritual meant that, you know, you weren't sexual. So, and, but yet I was a very sensual, creative being and creative energy can also be sexual energy so anyway um i waited quite a long time before i lost my virginity um i was 19 and once i started to make love i would really enjoy it in the moment but afterwards feel so much guilt so much shame because i would be like oh my gosh what have i done i'm not following a spiritual path anymore i'm you know, because I, I had sex, that's bad and wrong and, you know, all of these things. So anyway, coming to the, the story of India, I was in, I think, 2002, I was traveling around India and I knew that when I was there that something really powerful was going to happen that would change my life. And 
so I was in uh, Rajasthan, the golden city, and I met this man and he told me about Tantra. And he said, you know, Tantra is a way that you, that you can use your sexuality and make it sacred. So as soon as he th- said this, I was like, wow, you mean to say like, I, my sexuality can be spiritual and that it can be sacred. And yeah, and so that was like my big aha. And, and from then I was hooked. And so, you know, it took a few years and then I ended up going to a, a Tantra yoga school and really, you know, because I didn't just want to go into the, just the sexual realms of Tantra, which a lot of people think Tantra is about. And I wanted to have a more integrated approach. So I spent five years at a Tantra yoga school where we did um, three hours to four hours yoga classes that were just solo practices, working with energy and the chakras and all of these sorts of things. And, you know, from there I studied the Tao Tantra cards and Neo Tantra cards, which is more like modern Tantra. And I also had a traditional Tantra teacher from India. So we did a lot with yantras and yaganas and connecting to goddesses with mantra. So I've really tried to have quite a holistic approach to Tantra. And, you know, because I I know the word Tantra comes from India (laughs) and I'm a, you know, I'm a white woman. So I would say that my approach to Tantra is more of like a modern version of Tantra. And within that, I've also been very fascinated by um, conscious relating because I, I really see that many of us are just, we're just, we don't even know how to have relationships. You know, we're just going along. We have no idea how to relate and that gets us into trouble. We don't feel satisfied in our relationships. And the same thing with sexuality. We're only just touching the iceberg with sex. Like, you know, uh, men often don't even have an idea how to pleasure a woman and women's sexuality is very different to Mm -hmm. men's. So I don't know if many people realize that. But yeah, there's so much there and it really feels like this knowledge needs to come out into the world, especially in these times, because we've been a little bit unconscious in the areas of relationships and sexuality. So that's my passion. So I'm also a a love sex relationship coach and work with things around that. Yeah. So that's a little bit about me. (laughs) Wow. That's, that's a great story. And I love that you, you relate to India because a great part of big part of our audience is uh, in India from India uh, with the PMC uh, Global Group and the PSSM Global Group as well. So uh, I think it's really interesting to see how these folks will relate. And I look forward to having your comments uh, in in the the chats, you know, on the side of the the, the feed wherever you're watching this, because we, we'd really like to know your experience, especially from India, because I know a lot of people in India aren't always connected to these ancient practices. Mm-hmm. So maybe we can talk about that. Uh, a, a little bit about the ancient practices, but um, maybe we can talk about conscious relating and the difference between, you know, this modern Tantra and conscious relating and the, um, you know, the differences between ancient practices. And while you're doing that, I think my dog is outside. So you t- talk about that and I'll be right back because I have to go check. Okay. Okay. Conscious relating is- yes, please. okay yeah. So, um, Let's see. So the the conscious relating is very much about being present in your body, for one, and and talking from that place of presence. So a lot of these practices, like what I would call a modern day version of Tantra, is really, um, it's very spiritual because it is about being present in the moment and really relating from that place of presence. And so, you know, like... um, when we look at more the traditional Tantra or the classical Tantra, I would say, and, and you may know more things about this than me even because you're from India, but um, from my understanding, a lot of it was doing, you know, uh, ritual, working with yagnas, yantras, fire ceremonies. And, you know, a Kashmir in India was also a place where a lot of Tantra teachings came from. So, you know, you're lucky because India was actually a very powerful place for Tantra. And I, I know that in India that um, that there's also some negative things associated with Tantra. Um, just, you know, it can be seen as black magic. And, yeah, but that's uh, – there's actually there, – that is an aspect of Tantra because Tantra is really about embracing all of life, 
But for the people that are on a tantra path, it's really about choosing what direction. So, you know, there is the, uh, the black, t- t- black tantrics who are the ones that may go to a cemetery, for example, and, you know, eat dead bodies. And I know you have them, people like this in India, like the Agoris, I believe. Whereas the red tantra is more about sensuality, sexuality, that kind of thing. And then white tantra is more like the spiritual form of tantra, like very, you know, you might not even be sexual with someone and with white tantra. So you really have to pick which path you follow uh, with tantra. And a lot of the time in the West, we're focusing more on the red tantra, like the sexual, sensual and white. Like it could be more like a pink, which is a mixture of red and white that comes Mm. together. Well, because tantra is quite often associated with sex. And I know in the West, when people talk about tantra, they always think about sting from the police, Mm -hmm. right? There's always the, he used to talk back in the seventies about, you know, bragging about all of his tantric practices and things. Um, but I think it's really important for people to understand that there is that different level of, of different levels of tantra. It's not just about sex, right? I know um, we both studied with a, a local guy here in the five Tibetan. Yeah. Yeah. Jacques, the uh, five element uh, Tibetan tantra. Yeah. And their basic principle uh, that I loved was love with pleasure is medicine. And each person is our medicine, you know, even having this, there's medicine happening here, right? Because we're swapping energies, we're sharing, we're connecting. So there's an element of medicine for healing because they would use Tantra, right? For healing, right? So what's the, uh, how does that kind of connect in terms of Tantra for healing, love of pleasure being medicine, and then you know, again, sacred sexual, you know, that whole black stuff is not anything I'm really particularly interested in. There's enough of that going on in the world with Epstein and all of that stuff that's out there. And that's a whole nother wake up call out there for you guys out there. But, you know, how that mm-hmm. connects, we'll, we'll talk about that another day. Because I'm more interested in talking about, you know, finding out that conscious relating and how do people connect in, in a way, uh, especially when relationships are, are such an important part of our lives. And sex is an important part of most people's relationships or lack of it. Yeah. Right. Well, they they say that um, there's a quote from this guy from Portugal and he could say there can be no, uh, what is it? No, there can be no love in the world or something like that. There can be no peace on earth if there's war and love, something along those lines. Mm -hmm. And the thing is like, um, with this quote is what it made me realize is that in love and sex, that's where we sometimes have our biggest wars, you know, like that's where we get jealous if our partner is with someone else or, you know, having some kind of emotional relationship and sexual sexually too, like, you know, Oh no, like I can't get an erection or um, I don't feel like sex and my partner wants to have sex with me all the time. And we've got mismatched sex drives. And so, you know, like, and then you feel really, unhappy inside you know there's like or i'm just not satisfied in my relationship and so you're having an internal war but if you can come back to love in yourself and um have love with other people and learn how to be conscious and really you know learn to talk about some of these things that are hard to talk about like a lot of people have fear in talking about even hey i'm not having as much sex as i want for example Mm. and how can we work with this and you know, um, also people stay in relationships thinking that being in a relationship for your whole life is a good is, is a good relationship. But you might be really unhappy in your relationship and you might be abused and all sorts of things. So it doesn't mean that being in a relationship for life, especially in these modern times, means you're having a good relationship. It's you can have a good relationship that goes for a short time if mm-hmm. you're having you're having healing and growth in that relationship. So with conscious relating, we also like to look at our shadows. And, you know, it's also about exploring your edges. So if you find that you're someone who's a yes person all the time, you're saying yes to everything, maybe you want to look at being better at your nose, being better at having boundaries. So each person is a little different in what they need to work on, but you can find where where your work is just by seeing where you get triggered, where things come up for you and then it's like okay that might be something I need to work on who can support me with that maybe I need a coach 
maybe I just need to develop some, a new mindset or a new way of um, habits that will support me to really be empowered. Mm. And ultimately, to be happy in a relationship, you really need to be fully happy with yourself and to be able to be yourself. You're fully yourself in a relationship. So a lot of the time we might be like sacrificing things or. Oh, I've like, never done that. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> oh, yeah. I lie about other things too. Come on, Nate. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we all do it. You know, no, it, it, yeah. it's true. And I want to go backtrack because you said a couple of things here that makes me want to go back to your story. Because you talked about the fear of relationships and, and not having enough sex or you're not relating or what have you um, for a number of different reasons, which made me go all the way back to you were talking about being, um, you know, raised Christian, right? We weren't born that way. We we're born human. Right. But we're raised in a certain way with a different set of values and beliefs and depending what country or value systems, religion, anything that happens. And what I've seen and learned and experienced in the work I've been doing the past number of years and having the opportunity to speak to so many people that, you know, this shame around sexuality mm -hmm. is so common, is so powerfully restrictive and debilitating for so many people to live a fully experienced, like mm -hmm. totally joyful, orgasmic, like wonderful sex life. How does one bridge that? What, you know, I think part of it becomes, you know, what we learn from, like you talk about Christianity and, and spirituality and sexuality don't connect. And we'd always talk about, you know, in the world we're in about sacred sexuality. So how does how does one shift from shame to fully enjoying and being proud of and curious about their sexuality? Yeah, well that's a that's a good um question because for one like when you're in a state of shame it's basically like one of the lowest vibrational states you can be in and that causes you to yeah you're just not in your full joy and happiness which can kind of take you on a downward spiral if you keep being stuck in shame. So to to really move out of that, I mean, for me, what helped me to move through my own shame of like sexuality, especially being a woman, like there's a lot of programs like, you know, you're expected to be a porn star in the bedroom at the same time. You are um, supposed to be really pure and have, had, have no sex with anyone. <laughs> you know, like it, it's, it's a very complicated situation. Um, but yeah, for me to move through things like shame, I mean, I took step by step little steps to, I mean, even talking about sex, I used to feel very shameful about talking about sex. And, you know, the work I do is pretty edgy for a woman and I can have a lot of projections put on me and it takes a lot of courage. But the more that you can take baby steps and work through that shame and just go, okay, what if I talk to one person about sex today? Or, you know, like, especially the things that are really scary for you to talk about, definitely do them. <laughs> and, and then step by step, you're going to become more confident. And then this is the thing, it's the world needs role models, they need people that are comfortable to go against the things that are trying to keep us in shame. Because if you're like, for example, like, I'm really, you know, I'm doing that with um, things like sexuality, mm -hmm. all of those things. And and I know it helps other people when they see that because they realize they can also be like that if they want. Like it's really just believing you've got permission. Yeah. And, and you know, it, it's such a liberating mm -hmm. thing when you can kind of drop some of the shame or your restrictions or beliefs or things you've been, um, you know, led to believe is right or not. And we are, as human beings, we are animals. Um, and what I always say when it comes down to coaching and relationships is monog monogamy is not natural by nature, right? Or else we'd be with the first person we ever made love with. It would just be locked in like that. It'd be done like the wolves and the eagles and some penguins. And, you know, there's a few animals out there that, that, that do mate for life that way, you know? So monogamy is a choice and a lifestyle for one. That's just one. I'm just throwing that out there because, you know, people get caught up and, you know, you were talking about it earlier where you could have a short, beautiful relationship and get some medicine, mm -hmm. right? Learn and grow and expand. 
and then go, wow, thank you for the gifts you've brought to my life. Thank you. Still remain friends, but the relationship changes. Doesn't mean you'd never have sex again. Doesn't mean you never talk again. It, and it may mean exactly that, mm -hmm. right? But it's like, you know, if love is unconditional and we are love and love is what we all want, why the fuck are we always so um, hard on ourselves and each other when it comes to just accepting? Mm -hmm. I guess that's one of my questions. And because I always think, you know, the, the, the amount of knowledge, wisdom and everything else in this world, why do we have war? Why do we have suffering? And why do we have starvation? We have the knowledge. So what, what's that when it comes down to our relationships? How can we just, you know, not blame people for, you know, crap that happened in our past or whatever that is when it comes down to yeah. sex and relationships? Okay. Because how many people, how many people out there do you know that have been in a relationship, ended the relationship and be married, kids, whatever it might be, and then they bitch and complain about that relationship for the next 20 freaking years. Mm -hmm. And it's over. It's in the past. How do we get over that so we can live the most, you know, joyous life possible? Yeah, totally. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, ultimately it's always a choice, right? Like, and, mm. you know, the big thing is to realize that it's really good to have support, like whether it's mentors, whether it's reading a book even, like, or listening to some, some audio books, anything that's giving you support, giving you different ways to view things. Because sometimes we get stuck and we just don't even know how to get out of it. Right? Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, if you hold on to like a lot of resentment from say a breakup that happened 20 years ago, just think about the quality of life you're choosing. right? Or three days ago. Yeah. 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 Or yesterday. <laughs> yeah. And it's always a choice. And I mean, you know, when we say we may have a fresh breakup, we do, often need to go through a bit of a mm -hmm. healing process oh, because, absolutely. because when you break up it's it triggers some of your deep wounds and like that's really what's happening when, when you're going through a breakup it's often if uh, the wound of abandonment or the wound of reject rejection that is being triggered and and yet we kind of latch it onto that person and be like they did all these things to us and we become a victim right yeah um, well he, here's something tony said yesterday at, at the end of this these four days because he talks about how to live a, in a beautiful state and enjoying life. And then he talks about suffering. And the reality is everything's a choice, as you mentioned. Yeah. Separation equals suffering. Yeah. So as soon as we separate, oh, she doesn't love me anymore. He doesn't love me. They don't care. Now we've created separation. And if we don't control and remember consciousness from the very first show I ever did, consciousness is, is an awareness and it's about the conscious choice of the language we're going to use. Even, you know, we might just be, you know, use a language versus suffering. We're just going to transition or transform our relationships is very different than suffering. Mm -hmm. Right. But that's that pain because all of a sudden we feel separate from someone we thought we loved. Totally. And, you know, that comes up into an existential wound because, like, you know, say before we're born, we're in this state of, like, oneness, right? Mm. And then you're born, and that's the first thing where you might feel some separation. It's like a separation from spirit, right? And then, so when you're going through a breakup, it's, you feel separated from love. That's what's going on. Mm -hmm. It's like, mm -hmm. um, and you, you know, you're desiring love and you're desiring like that feeling of one, you know? Um, but yeah, it's, it's a process to like, that's why it's important to do self-love practices and really find a way to be full in the inside because nobody externally is ever going to make you happy. <laughs> like I hate to say that. <laughs> no, don't I love, I love that she says that because your happiness is not outside there. It's not outside of you. My happiness doesn't lie in Naomi loving me or not. I know she loves me as a human being and a spiritual goddess that she is right. Never ever think your happiness is outside of you because it all comes in here first. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to be happy. You know, if you want to love someone else, love yourself first, because you'll never really love someone mm -hmm. if you're not loving yourself first. 
Exactly. Right. Exactly. I don't, th I personally don't believe that's why you might think it's love, but then I would say it's attachment. It's fear of loss. It's about wanting it bad enough, but exactly. is that really love? Yeah. No. <laughs> right. How many people are in a relationship now have been in a relationship before, or will be in a relationship in the near future? When you know at some point, even though the infatuation and all the excitement at the beginning, but then once you get to know each other, you can, might go, hmm, nah, this isn't really working for me, or, you know, it's not really right. And how many people still hang on? I've done that once, twice, or three times in my life. <laughs> <Two>. <laughs> right. But then this is what Jacques was taught in, in that Tibetan thing is, yeah. you know, everybody's our medicine. What do you learn? Did, did you get to do something sexually you've never done before? Was that your learning? Did you get to have an experience of travel? Uh, you know, because people show up in a different, in different ways and bring different gifts to our lives. And, and I think it's important to express that and this is where i think we can bridge the gap too into conscious relating yeah right mm -hmm. and are you aware of how you're relating remember consciousness is awareness at its core without spirituality because we're going to talk about the awareness of how we are relating if we're in a relationship and i'm not telling you what i really want need and desire mm -hmm. are we really fully consciously relating exactly and what if like say you know, I'm building a bunch of resentment because I don't like, let's pretend you're my partner. In this yeah. moment, but well, I let's don't. not pretend right now. No, <laughs> just easy. <laughs> but you know, like say, you know, he's leaving his socks around the place and I'm like, oh my gosh, like it's such a mess, you know? And I just, and then I start to notice more things like, oh, he's not doing the dishes. And then I'm starting to build all this resentment, but I don't tell him, right? <laughs> I'm just like, bro. <laughs> and then one day I either flip out and be like, what the hell? You're such a mess. <laughs> like, Who can relate to that? <laughs> and it might not be socks or dishes. It might be the garbage. It might be making the bed. It could be yeah. anything. Yeah, exactly. Right? So we, we hold these things in and it's really important to talk about it because these things can be scary to talk about. But the thing is, when you talk, like communication is such a big key with, um, I'd say, conscious relating. And it's it's an art to learn how to communicate well. And it can take a bit of time, really, to master it. But even just a basic rule of thumb is, like, say if you have an issue with someone, to come from this place of I. Like, I notice that I'm finding myself getting a little bit um, irritated when I see the socks everywhere, you know? Uh, <laughs> and that's because I have this need and desire for a beautiful, clean environment. It really helps me to, ah, uh, like relax and, you know, and be more productive, all sorts of things. Right. So, well, I, I feel the same way about the clean and en environment. So I know they weren't my socks. Whose socks were they, <laughs> sweetheart? <laughs> I think it was the dog. The dog yeah. was like socks. <laughs> and he was locked outside somehow. So that's why he was barking. Thanks for. Yeah. Yeah, he yeah, wanted to join and have some love too. You know? He always does. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> now he's watching. Yeah. In a very acute posture. Yeah. <laughs> so conscious relating. Now you had a pink puja here uh, in our home, which is really interesting for some people as well, because a it's COVID time. So we navigated that with consent, yeah. which is what, you know, conscious relating is about. Um, maybe you can tell us what, what's a, puja what's a pink puja and what kind of exercises can people do to open up the lines of communication so that they can talk about the socks on the floor and the things that are bugging them and the things that they want and desire mm -hmm. how do we open up those lines of communication especially if i think you're going to reject me oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay so you want me to talk about the puja first or? well yeah and, and how they you know if there's a connection, but yeah. you know, whatever you okay. feel called, because yeah. I know that the puja is really important because people are connecting and it's about communication and consent yes, and consent yeah. is huge yeah. uh, in the world of conscious relating. It is. It's really important. And even just things like boundaries and, um, you know, being authentic as well. Like, uh, 
you know, often a lot of us are putting on masks and trying to be a particular way. And she doesn't mean a COVID mask, yeah, exactly. right? Just, just to be clear, she's talking about a mask. Like this isn't really me mask versus yeah. a, this won't save my life either mask. <gasps> That's a wake up call for you for another day. Yeah, so, you know, it's, um, and that's part of Tantra as well. So um, Osho, maybe you've heard of Osho. He actually came from India and he was, he was very good at helping people to get into their authentic nature and really get out of things. And I actually went to the Osho Center in oh, China, wow. in India, um, just for a week. But one of the things that stood out to me when I was there is that um, we were on this orientation day and they were getting us to dance and we had people from all over the world and it was so fascinating because you know like and as a westerner <laughs> i have like say my way of dancing right and then you know like there was indian people there too and like you know you have a different way of dancing mm -hmm. which um is like beautiful like if i look at say the bollywood or like dancing things like this it's a very fluid movement in many ways and like, I'm like, wow, sometimes I'm like, how do you do those things with your body? It's amazing. <laughs> I, I, I grew up in North America as a Canadian white kid, you know, couldn't dance or anything like that. We did the old two-step growing yeah. up in school. Yeah. It's like, oh, my God. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's like. <laughs> totally. And then you go to, say, Latin America and everyone's oh, moving their hips. Yeah. It's all, you know, my hips are locked. I'm just wor <laughs> still working on getting those things moving. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so it's really good to be aware of like conditioning, you know, and, mm -hmm. and conditioning can stop us from being authentic. Wounding from our past can stop us from being authentic. Um, yeah, so those are sorts of things. It's like, okay, so I've been culturally conditioned to dance in a particular way, but mm -hmm. how can I just let go of all of that and just what does my body want to do? How does it want to move? What is the impulse telling me? Maybe my impulse wants to just go like this and dance and... <laughs> Ooh, yeah. <laughs> you know, I, do crazy things that don't look normal. But it's just, you you know, when you really drop into that place of, like, authenticness, that's where you mm -hmm. really won, let's say, a dance. And that can feel very, and like, an enlightening moment. It's mm -hmm. like um, the dance is dancing you then as opposed to you, like, oh, should I move my arm like this to look cool? Like, what do I need to do? You know, and it's like then you become more stiff and the energy stops moving. So we want to liberate that energy or liberate the Shakti in our bodies, like that life force, right? And then it's like, whoa, like you can you can get naturally high when you do that. <laughs> yeah, well, there, I know, you know, there, they've got different dance programs, trance dancing and all sorts. And when I started changing and, and doing these events, at first it was kind of awkward. You know, and then once you actually let go and, and what I thought was really interesting that you mentioned was, you know, when you kind of let the body take over, what does the body want to do? Yeah. And this becomes a really interesting thing because who would have thought that, you know, I was conditioned to, to a stupid two step white guy dance move. I wouldn't have thought about that growing up or anything different. And then you go out there and you see people dance and having fun. And I think it's also interesting to point out that. If we take a look through cultures throughout history, they've been dancing and singing and chanting mm -hmm. for ages. Yeah. Right? And there's a reason. Yeah. When you move your body and get that energy flowing, life becomes very, very different. Mm -hmm. So how does one, how do you get past that, uh, you know, that rigid robotic, one day, what's going on? How to? Yeah, well, I mean, like, Part of it is like say if you're having a lot of fear and uh, security about being on the dance floor and dancing then you, you like it like everything you've got to just get out there and give it a go um like for some people actually getting even having a bit of alcohol or <laughs> doing drugs might even help them initially to let go of their um their mindsets and you know like their inhibitions the inhibitions that's right yeah. the inhibitions um otherwise you know even going to a dance class can be good like going to like ecstatic dance mm -hmm. which is not really having a, a particular style but you got to start somewhere you got to like go down that track and like i mean for me personally like i actually for drink i had to drink like a little bit of alcohol to really like get mm. rid of my inhibitions initially but you, you know i'm not encouraging alcohol drinking because like you don't want to get dependent on something. So that was what I realized with it. It's like, yeah. 
I was like, oh, suddenly I need a drink now in order to be comfortable dancing. So then I was like, this isn't good because now the alcohol is in control of me. So that's where you want to, you know, get rid of the alcohol then and just yeah. be comfort. But it can be a little bit of a training wheel. It's Well, it's back in the plant medicines. We had talked with Dennis McKenna a few weeks ago and, you know, how plants are teachers and psychedelics and, mm -hmm. you know, even alcohol has its place for yeah. different things. But it's, is it a tool? Is it a crutch? Is it a bad habit now and become an addiction? And then you associate, if you associate your relationships, your dancing, your sexuality and everything with sex or with booze, then an alcohol, you're always going to be doing those things. Exactly. But they can certainly be an opener to loosen things up. And I got to tell you, in my experience, the biggest one, the biggest awakening for me was actually an open partner. Right. You know, when all of a sudden you could, you felt comfortable and safe to yeah. actually have the conversations and to relate in that way of someone who actually understands where all of a sudden it's like, Oh my God, I'm perfect. Just the way I am. And someone loves me for me. Oh my, like it was, it was the, like just a, I didn't have to be anyone else. Totally. Yeah. I, totally. I was simply me and loved and appreciated for that. And anything I ever wanted to do, she was like, okay. Mm -hmm. Anything she wanted to do, she was going to do it anyways <laughs> because she was open and free and liberal and she didn't have so much shame and, and blame around all of, no, she had some wounds like many of us do, yet she was open mm -hmm. to the pleasure that she could experience in life. Mm -hmm. Um, which was a such a freeing thing for me because it let me know it's okay. Yeah, and it definitely helps having partners that mm -hmm. can uh, do that for you. And, you know, even just hearing that, that's also something that you could offer someone else, right? So it's really looking at where you start to go into judgment and um, where you start to put a lot of expectations on people, that starts to restrict them. And, you know, like even for me as a woman, I'm like, oh, I noticed how I put a lot of, like, expectations on a guy and wanted to change him in the mm. past, you know, like a partner. <laughs> and, you know, like, while you can have a conscious relationship where you're both um, calling each other out on your, your um, shit, right? But then there's a, another, the, the kind of shadow side of that is, like, you know, becoming the nag and, like, you're mm -hmm. not doing this and you're not doing that. Um but yeah, so that, that it definitely is important to, to, when you go into that conscious realm of like, you can be like a mirror, like, hey, I've noticed that you're playing small, like in this part of your life, when I really see you as someone who could do this or, mm -hmm. you know. And the other thing that you were mentioning, so one thing that we like to do, and I don't know, we could circle back to the puja, but um, so there's this thing around, uh, like, and I kind of call it like Shiva Shakti, working with Shiva Shakti, um, and when I say that, it's like, uh, so Shiva is seen as consciousness and, and this is in the tantric tradition and Shakti is like energy, power, like life force, right? It's, it's everything that's changing in life. Mm -hmm. So when you do exercises in Tantra, we work with polarity. And so, uh, when you work with these two different poles, it can, um, create a really powerful polarity. So one of the things we did in the the puja, which um, really is basically a, a, like a ritual where you're working with a partner. Like usually you rotate around partners if you come as a single, but mm -hmm. if you come with your own partner, like your husband or boyfriend or girlfriend, um, you can choose to just stay together and do all the practices. But um, so there's this thing that we did in the last puja, which was one person is witnessing the other one mm -hmm. dancing an expression of what their heart was telling them, you know, so the person would listen to their heart. Oh, what does my heart want me to know? And then dancing that, right? And um, this just being witnessed without judgment with someone who has full presence, it helps you to feel safe, right? Whereas if, say, you're with someone and they're not present and they're like, oh, mm. look at that person over there or this one, you don't feel relaxed to be mm -hmm. yourself. And it can be very vulnerable, like, what well, another thing that we sometimes look at is like Shakti needs to feel safe to really open, mm. right? And that's it's like that expression of you needs to feel safe to open. So when you're with a very open, comfortable partner, that's very like, oh yeah, I want to see you really being you. And mm -hmm. I don't have any judgment if you're doing that. Like that's probably the big thing 
Whereas, you know, maybe you had other partners in the past that were like super like judging of you no. and expecting things of you. Yeah, I'd lie if that if I'd say that's not the truth. And what I think is interesting too is how much of it was them doing that to me and then there's the side of what was I doing to myself in order to protect, maintain, keep the relationship. Yeah. Um, so right. that, you know, where was I not being my authentic self because of the fear of the potential of the loss of the relationship if I wasn't what I thought they yeah. expected me or thought I should be because then I've got another mask on and then I've got another mask on. And all of a sudden, you know, I worked a job for years to, you know, sure it's financial safety, security, and comfortability, but I didn't go chase my dream because it also kept my lady happy. My, my parents thought it was great to have a safe, secure job. And yeah, it was a good, comfortable life. There was no question about it, but I wasn't fully, you know, passionate about it yes. in, in the sense of, you know, I should be doing more. You know, so, you know, you're sacrificing what you really want, who you are, what you know in your heart, your spirit and your soul is true for you, yet you're not expressing that because of the fear of loss of love, really, and totally. sex or totally. whatever that might be. And, you know, sometimes these patterns can creep up on you even without, even if you could go into the relationship and you really have the best intentions, Sometimes they can still creep up and you're like, oh, but I'm afraid to lose love or you get attached to the person and it's a lot harder to leave them. But it's really important to really put yourself first or like really loving mm -hmm. yourself first. Like, um, yeah, and and just uh, like get support if you find it's hard for you. Um, have friends around that you that can help you, you know, go see coaches, mentors. Yeah, surround yourself with like-minded people. Yeah. And and I believe I've shared this uh, before because, you know, the power of your peer groups, the people you surround yourself with, you will become like. Yeah. If you, you know, it's like water seeks its own level. And we've seen this in our community where we have people come into our community and some people think we're a bunch of crazies, <laughs> right? Is that not true? They're like, oh my God, you guys are like crazy. And then they come in, they experience what happens and they leave lit up going, oh my God, I didn't even know these groups, these things existed. Mm -hmm. And we wake up people one person at a time sometimes. Mm -hmm. And the power of these groups where people all of a sudden let down their guard, yeah. right? And there becomes this authentic realness that is the most beautiful thing. When you, when, when a woman is feeling safe and secure and knowing you're not just a guy trying to hit on her, or get in her pants or something, it, it's a much more beautiful relationship because they're safe. They're opening, they're flowering in that sense. Right. Mm -hmm. And so many, so many men look at women and this is my experience and I've seen it, um, you know, and they're just, you know, it's just, they're, they're an object, they're a sexual object of desire versus a divine, beautiful, sacred mm -hmm. being of light and love that creates life. I honor the divine feminine. And it's one of the things I do is create and that space because you know what, let's face it. Every single person watching this has come through a woman in some way, shape or form. It's just what is they are the creators and incubators and they don't even really need men anymore. They just need one part of us and they don't need us for much of anything else anymore. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for me, it's, you know, as a man, are you honoring the divine feminine or are you rolling and control ruling and controlling and dominating your, your lady because you think that's the way it is and you learned it somewhere, mm -hmm. you know, and ladies, are you doing the same thing to your man? Are you controlling them because you've got the ultimate power? Right. Because it's amazing what a man will do for a woman and what love does. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's a powerful thing. Now, you talked about exercises. How does one consciously relate? How does one, you know, what, what, what are the things that people can do, you know, to start? If, you, if you're at home right now with your partner and many people are having relationship issues with the COVID thing too, because they've never spent so much time with their, 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 their lovers, wives, partners, and friends. Right. You know, and, and it, it's, it's creating, you know, some 
you know, tension for some people. What do we do about that? How? What's an easy thing we can do? Well, you know, there's a few different things that is nice um, to do. Like, um, for one, just having some moments of presence with each other, which when I say that, it could be just sitting down with each other and eye-gazing, for example. What does eye-gazing mean? It's like this. Eye-gazing is like this. So you're looking into each other's eyes and, you know, it can maybe feel even a little intimidating at first, but really like be with everything that is coming up for you, right, as you're eye gazing. And then as you're looking in the eye, sometimes it's hard to look at both, so then you can mm -hmm. look more into the left eye. Mm -hmm. uh, so you do this for a few minutes. It's really beautiful. It's because super powerful. And if I just want to share one thing, you know, Naomi was saying it can feel uncomfortable for a while because you think you're just kind of staring at each other. And don't be some weirdo and like, you know, because because that's just creepy. People don't like that. Um, but my experience is, as you said, it, it is uncomfortable in the beginning. Mm -hmm. And what I've experienced is as you breathe in, and one little nugget I always say, if you can match their breath, because as soon as we gazed, it, it, the, the interesting thing, as soon as we gazed, I, the first thing I noticed was our eyes locked and we both breathed the same right away. It was like, yeah. boom, yeah. right? Because it, it helps us connect in a different way. You're matching up your breath, matching up different things. But what I found is the more you breathe deeper and slowly when you're doing this eye gazing, all of a sudden you just get lighter everywhere. And I it was like a physical, like all of a sudden, <sighs> yeah. Oh, your heart just opens more and more. And then all of a sudden you see more and more and more of the divine soul in front of you. Totally. Right? And it's beautiful. Like I remember like one of the first times that I did eye gazing in a, a tantra gathering. And it was like one of my first tantric experiences. And it was like a very profound experience. Cause I was like, Oh my gosh, like normally I'm meditating by myself and, stuff like this, but now it's like I'm meditating with somebody else. You mm -hmm. know? Like I'm going into this amazing <laughs> meditative state and I'm doing it with someone else. Like I'm looking at them in the eyes and it was very powerful, that experience. And so, you know, it can be like a meditation because mm -hmm. as I look in your eyes, for mm -hmm. example, it might be like, oh, I'm noticing like a bit of uncomfortableness or, you know, like I'm, I'm noticing my heart's opening or like really like, it's like, you know, what is happening in, inside mm -hmm. of you? Like what it, you can meditate on you as you meditate on them, basically. Yeah. Um, so that's a really great way to just create connection. And as Mark was saying, also synchronizing the breaths. And I mean, Mark and I have both done a lot of eye gazing <laughs> in our lives. So it's quite easy for us to naturally mm -hmm. sync up breaths. Um, but that's really good because when you synchronize the breaths, it connects you beyond the mind. So synchronizing breath so eye gazing and synchronizing breath is a great thing to do another thing that can be good like is to just say something nice to the partner like mm. sincerely you know, yeah <laughs> exactly. you know what is something you appreciate about them or mm -hmm. what is something you feel grateful for like that's a really great way to to create some love um mm. together and there's there's a great exercise that i like to do often in many of my events is like you do a, what is called a dyad mm. and it would be like saying you know what do you desire? And then you would answer. I desire unconditional love. Oh, beautiful. <laughs> and then I would say, thank you. And then, I, I mean, I would ask him again, what do you desire? I desire a great partner who allows me to be free. Thank you. What do you desire? I desire... What else do I desire? I desire... This is the beauty of the dyad because you have to go in and, and think about it, right? So I desire a just totally connected partnership, mm, okay. common goals. Yeah. Mm. So you get the idea. So one person is asking the same question over and over again. The other person's answering. And, you know, as Mike was saying, is sometimes it's like, oh, I, I don't know what to say anymore. But it's like as you go deeper into it, like even if mm -hmm. you get stuck and you're like, oh, I've run out of things to say, if you just sit with it, something will come up, mm -hmm. often, even if you're just sitting there looking at the person for a bit. And, and it's to go into the heart. It's one thing I've learned in all the work that I do. <clears throat> if you're in your head, you're dead. Get in your heart, you're smart, right? I got in my head there and I had to drop in. 
to my heart to get the answer yeah. because the head will mess you up all the time yeah. because you'll want to logic thing you'll want versus feel it and know it in the heart always knows mm -hmm. in my experience anyways. yeah totally totally um yeah so so then you know what once we've done the, mm -hmm. the desire then we go into like what do you fear or what are you afraid of right be alone. I'm afraid of being alone. <laughs> yeah. Is that mm. one of the things you think? Uh, it, it was at one point, actually. You know, it was uh, took me a long time to actually get comfortable, um, A, being single, because I was always driven by connection and love and wanting to do stuff. And it was if it was at least doing something and being in a partnership. I've been a serial monogamist for 20 years of my life and for the first time in my life over the past few years i am the most comfortable i love my alone time i love my single time i'm surrounded by beautiful divine goddess women of you know consciousness and education and music and you know such as yourself you know our, our people have, have met theta as well you know these are our friends that i get to work with and play with and grow with and you know you become who you hang around with right you know that i'm not that i'm going to become a woman <laughs> but it's the it's the beautiful gifts of my life that that i'm really happy and honored to be able to share with with you watching this right now because it's it's a practice it didn't just happen for me overnight and this is one thing i want to get back to you know or, or kind of segue into is these things are a practice yeah it's yeah. not like oh you just do it and you're done. You don't go to the gym and build a muscle in one workout. Yeah. You know, you have to practice doing these things and feeling these emotions and then being able to have that clear conscious conversation. Hey, you know, you did this and, and it's like, this is how it made me feel. Yeah. Right. And it's, yes, I know I felt that way because of me. So then to have someone you can trust and have this conversation and someone who gets it and can ask, well, well where did that really come from? What does that mean for you? When was the first time you felt that way? Totally. Right? Versus someone who's just going to be, oh, my God, yeah. yeah. Because that's not going to work. If you're bitching out your significant other, it's not going to work. Shame and blame isn't going to work. And if you want to blame someone for all the bad stuff, folks, blame them for all the good stuff, too. Because that's really important. You can't have good without bad, up without down. It's the paradox of light, light without dark. Right. Totally. And, and you know, it just reminded me of this thing from authentic relating is that often um, when we're getting into conflict, we're either in this place of posturing, which is like, I'm right, and then you might be like, I'm right, I'm right, I'm right. No, I'm right. No, I'm right. No, I'm right. <laughs> <laughs> but then you're not actually able to come into connection when you're in that place. And mm -hmm. you're probably deeply longing connection, but then you're in this place of just basically hitting heads, right? And the opposite of that, where you, you're not having connection, is collapse, where you go into a place of collapse, right? So mm -hmm. it's like, oh, like, okay, I'll do whatever you want, but I'm really not wanting to do that, right? So you mm -hmm. want to come into this place of equanimity, and that is what helps you to come back into connection. So, you know, get curious, and and uh, rather than, all right, okay, I'm going to collapse, or I'm going to say that I'm right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um yeah so that's so we, so we have eye gazing yeah eye gazing synchronizing breaths yep and dyad dyad is another super powerful really good thing to do um you know so we, we like to work with things like um being in the body like if that's yeah more like dance eye, yeah dancing um what about massage massage is always fun <laughs> <laughs> well i one thing i loved about the uh, <clears throat> the tantra festival <clears throat> and uh and that was a number of years ago in Squamish when I first attended was all the different exercises that we did. So it was like three days. Yeah. Right. And we yeah. did a lot of different things. And some people thought it was going to be this crazy sexual orgy of tantric awesomeness, which it was not. Yeah. All right. It was not sexual in that nature at all. Um, yet you, you took us through all these different levels of, you know, the different types of touch for tantric massage, okay. like a water touch, a fire touch, an air touch. Exactly. And actually, right? I did that in the puja the other day. Ah, nice. So we do this thing called elemental touch, and it's, uh, you work with earth touch, which is more like this firm, grounding, still touch. And then you have the water touch, which is more like 
you know, moving around the body it can be nice to do it with oil. Mm. It's um, more like, cause water moves, right? It's not as solid. Yeah, it's fluid. As it. It flows. Yeah, it's fluid. Exactly. And then the fire is more like, it's a bit shocking. So it's like things like scratching and hair pulling, and fighting. Mm. <laughs> yeah. And kind of like predator, prey little or dominant. animalistic. Like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's, um, it can be like, not everyone's cup of tea. That one's a little, always the one that's a bit edgy, but fire is edgy. It's not going to be a. Well, and I, I think we all have that in us because if you're all going to be all air at some point, there's got to be some fire. Yeah. Right. Well, if you want to have transformation, you need fire. Hmm. You need like this. I like that. Yeah. If you're going to have transformation, you need fire. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Exactly. And then, you know, you go to the air, which is this more like, it's a little bit like water, but it's a lot lighter touch and, you know, things like you can use your hair to like stroke along feathers, that kind of thing. Right. Mm -hmm. And then we even go to the ether touch or the space touch, which is more like energetic. So it could be running the hands over the body or very, very tiny, like light touch over the body. Mm -hmm. So this kind of thing, yeah, we really like work with a lot of different tools. And I mean, there's so many practices that you can do in Tantra. Well, I know. And, and in, in an hour here today, we can't possibly cover yeah. everything. Yeah. Um, are you going to start doing some online courses to start teaching some yeah. of this stuff? And... Well, actually, um, so, so far I have a, an online course for men, which is Ooh. called Tantric Masculinity. And it's a lot about solo, it's solo practices. Um, She's probably going to tell these men to withhold too, I bet. I do. Yeah. yeah. Which well, is a tantric practice because <laughs> orgasm and apparently ejaculation are not necessarily synonymous. However, exactly. we have been conditioned exactly. that way in our exactly. world. Yeah. Which is why, why I love the field of tantra and conscious relating because there's so many things that we've been so unconscious about. So the thing, the thing is with um, ejaculation for men is that many men think that have an orgasm you must ejaculate but there are actually two different biological processes mm -hmm. so you can actually learn to separate ejaculation from um orgasm because often as you get older especially you start to feel drained or you feel like you lose connection from your partner when you ejaculate right? the Taoists will call that your chi your jing your, your jing. life yeah. force exactly. right exactly and yeah. you start to waste that life force right so you want to keep that vitality, keep that life force, and um, because you can direct that energy into purpose, you can direct it into many things. Like let's say you ejaculate and you feel tired, then it's like, oh, I don't really feel like being super motivated with my work now. <clears throat> Whereas if you have that energy of like, oh, I just had this amazing love making session with my partner, and I did have orgasm without ejaculation. Now I'm like full power ready to get into my work and mm. I can also make love for you know hours if I want because you learn how to master that so the thing what I like to say is learn how to master your semen retention and um, then it actually you can learn how to have orgasm without ejaculation then you can learn how to have full body orgasm multiple, multiple or orgasms. orgasms and so that's pretty exciting um, but then you have ejaculatory choice. So that's the position you want to be in. You want to be mm -hmm. in a place of ejaculatory choice. And there's even like, I think Mantakshi or the Taoist tradition, they have a formula where they say, okay, as you get older, like say you're 39, you want to ejaculate. I think it's every eight days or every seven days. Yeah. He, Mantakshi has got kind of like an age thing. The older you get, the less you want to, yeah. the younger you are, the more energy you have. Yeah. So, but, but I think I'm glad that you brought up Mantakshi because if anybody's interested, he's got some great books out there. Uh, sexual reflexology, one of my favorites, what you learn there, you know, we haven't even talked about lingam massage, yoni massage yeah. and the power of that healing and the reflexology attached to that. Um, and the multi orgasmic couple is, is another great book. Like the, these are Taoist traditions that he's brought out um, and practices that have been going on for thousands of years. Yeah, totally. Right? It's, uh, they're very powerful, powerful stuff. And um, so anyway, circling back, like, so I'm, I put on a tantric masculinity mm -hmm. course for men, which is working a lot with the ejaculation uh, control and ejaculation choice. And then, you know, the last one of the modules, Understanding Woman, 
And so that's a seven week course. And then I'm going to be running one for women. So understanding so, woman, is that another seven week course in that one yeah. course? No. Yes. Well, this is the thing that I'm actually going to do. Will we ever be able to understand women? Really? I, I think I need to sign up for this one. Yes. And that's actually my plan. It's funny you bring that up because my plan is like, okay, seven week, more like solo practices, learning about yourself as a man. Then the next seven weeks we're going to do is, is all going to be about understanding women because, um, you know, I hate to say it, guys, but like you, many of you don't really understand women. And uh, and as soon as I think I do, I get schooled pretty fast that I don't. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, it's not your fault. Like, you know, we're very different to men in many ways, like sexually. Mm -hmm. I, like, for example, like women need to be turned on from the top down and the out in whereas men you know most time we can just touch your genitals pretty quickly and you're okay with it right like it's it's good you like it but if you go straight for our genitals it can be like ah oh. and 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 just to preface this it's not this the case for everyone like this is a generalization or you could say it's more like feminine sexuality masculine sexuality and, and i want to add to that too is the uh the conscious relating in the consent part. So consent's one thing, which is really good. Love, we could have a whole conversation and show about consent because I'm even confused because some gals, if you ask me to kiss me, I'm not even interested in some gals. If you kiss them, you're on sexual assault charges. So guys, we're getting confused more and more every day after the me too movement and all of these things. How do you navigate that? You know, that's one. Yeah. And you know, it's, I, I, as a man, I'll relate. Every woman is different. I, I love what you said about top down and out to in. Yeah. And because all of a sudden, you know, I, I was with a partner one time and no, it wasn't not this top down uh, is like, and I'm like, what do you mean? That's like, that's like 45 minutes into my routine, <laughs> you know? And, but this is why it's important to talk and converse and have these conversations mm -hmm. openly and not to be concerned about being rejected or, or shamed because that is part of the issues that's happening in relationships these days. So it's about opening up that and, and really finding that confidence to have that conversation openly and honestly is like, what works for you? Touch me this way. Don't touch me that way. You can touch me here, but you can't touch me there. Exactly. Right. And, and with that, it can really help to have, um, to create a context of where the conversation is happening. So, you know, be like, okay, I'd like to talk to you at, at mm -hmm. this time. Does it work for you? Um, and like, I'd like to talk about this aspect or, or something like that. Right. So you're very conscious and then it could be like, okay, you can have five minutes just to express whatever you want. And then I'll have five minutes. So you can even time things, but sometimes just creating a safe container is very good. And I don't think we're always good at doing that even in relationships. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, we might be pretty good at beginning. I'd say like beginning relationships is often what most people are the best at. And then it's, the okay. It's so true. Let's, let's take a look at that right now. Yeah. Why are we, when we get in a relationship, it's like, Oh, goo goo gaga. And it's all exciting and hot and passionate and everything. And then, you know, usually it's a few months in, it starts getting all kind of weird. Why is that? Because how many yeah. people relate to that? Yeah. I know I can. Totally, you do. And so what is often happening is you're in the honeymoon phase in that initial period where everything, you do look at the partner with rosy goggles and you feel so in love and it's amazing and they're amazing. They're the best thing ever. So is that, you said you're feeling in love. Yeah. Is that feeling really love? Well, and this is the thing, it is it is an aspect of love, but it's not the full Monty or the full picture of love. So mm. it's kind of like this infatuation love or this, more like romantic love, right? Mm. But, you you know, to really go into a place of love is, is kind of like what you're saying with that past girlfriend of like really accepting the other as they mm. are and allowing them to be them and you're able to be you. Like that's where you can really come into a beautiful space of, of love together, right? And, and I got to say, it takes work again that's the practice because it's not always easy to have those conversations mm -hmm. yet the more you do it the easier it is the bigger the muscle gets and then it becomes remember we talked about conditioning the more we do things in a peak state and it feels good it'll anchor it into our body yeah. right it'll anchor it into our nervous system will become who we are and just how we do things naturally 
with a conscious awareness again. So then it just becomes an unconscious way of being. And, and I think that's really important because for most people, these kinds of conversations in a relationship for the average, especially the average Westerner, I can't speak for other people in different cultures because that's not my life um, and what I've seen. It's not a comfortable thing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and we have so many mixed messages with media advertising. Sex is great, but don't know. Don't show this on TV. Yeah. But hey, look at all the magazines. Look at like it's it's this real kind of paradox of how this Western world is using sex mm -hmm. for marketing and everything else and then confusing the bejesus out of people. Totally, like, you know, often you're either watching porn or you're watching some kind of movie and then, you you know, you see how they have sex and you think that's how you're supposed to have sex. But um, the problem is with porn and stuff like that is you start to become like a performer and you're no longer present in your body and you're no longer being authentic, right? It's like... Or you might start to feel insecure. Hey, my cock isn't like this long. <laughs> <laughs> when truthfully, or well, my vagina isn't like got the tiny lips, you know, in the middle. Mm -hmm. um, but then, you know, but that's like a very small percent of the population that is going to look like a porn star. So, you know, it's, and, and, and the thing is like, that's what, again, I love about Tantra is it's like, let's get out of all the agendas. Let's be in the present. Like, and then, you know, you're like connecting with your partner and you're like mm. having this slow um, touch and you you can like just from a touch, you can have an orgasmic experience mm. if you're fully present with the way that you're touching, really feeling that other's body. It's it's beautiful. Yeah, it, it really is about bringing consciousness, that awareness into how we relate. Exactly. you know in a sacred and divine way yeah. you know with meditation with spirituality with you know a connectedness to spirit and to self and nature totally. versus just being um you know a machine yeah. you know or you know a conditioned member of you know some belief system and and i think we see in in so many and i'm not making out out to make religion wrong um yet i i think that there are some restrictions and some belief systems there that you know in some cases hold people back from being really fully self-expressed and you know we are you know spiritual beings and we're here to have fun and enjoy life and and there shouldn't be any shame attached to pleasure and yeah. love yeah and and especially in pleasure we can be a lot of shame you know, as, as women especially like you're like oh i shouldn't show my pleasure like mm. but it's oh it's, it's when you're in that place of shame and you're not showing your pleasure it shut your body isn't allowed to have the energy move throughout mm. it and it, it kind of stops your full orgasmic pleasure potential yeah shame. and and if you're living a, a joyful blissful free life you are healthier you are happier you beam and you glow and you know life changes when you're repressing yourself and not being fully free you know that creates also dis-ease mm -hmm. right you know it, it's it's a restriction and one thing i think is really interesting is you know and this is why you see people having an affairs outside their relationships um because their needs aren't being met they might value um, monogamy and um what's the word i'm looking for um but anyways monogamy and they'll say they never cheat yet they end up cheating on their husband their wife their partner their spouse who you know whatever the relationship may be because their needs aren't being met how many men out there go have literally gay relationships because they're bisexual and they don't say anything to their wives and at some point their needs right overtake their values and then they violate their values because their needs aren't being met because they haven't been able to communicate that same as you know and it doesn't mean that they have to be gay it could be just another woman too or whatever that might be but we see it all the time and same as women you know having affairs outside of their relationships when they said no i i value being monogamous and, and being and dedicated it to my partner and yet at some point they violate their values mm. to meet their needs and this is why it's so important for us to get past the shame the blame the 
fear of rejection so that we can express to the people who, you know, say they love us and want to be with us what's true for us. Because if we're going to judge our partners and go, you're wrong, this is not, then you don't really have a relationship. What you've got is a control situation so you can meet your needs so you don't feel alone, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You know, really. Yeah. Um, you know, and I just want to encourage people to be real. What is it that you'd love to share with your partner, your spouse? Yeah. What is it that you've always wanted to do that you've never done? What are you afraid of? in that way mm -hmm. and what would need to happen for you to express that openly honestly authentically from your heart to your partner what it is you need because if you're not need if you're not getting fully what you need and desire there's a part of you right that isn't being fully expressed mm -hmm. and it's okay to have those desires when it's done consciously with love with pleasure with appreciation with the d divine thank you so much for the gift of that whatever that is and that could just be eye gazing that could be as simple as a dyad be as simple as a massage yeah. it might be as simple as go getting a massage from someone else as couples yeah right there's so many things you can do and if there's one thing that i you know our goal here is to inspire you to wake up to what is possible for you out there in your marriage and your relationships and your love life and your sex life and your fantasy life mm -hmm. right yeah exactly awesome so we now we have gone over time which is is okay because we're on social media there's not like a new show coming on right after us so that's one of the things i love um if people are interested in knowing more about you your work reaching out to you how can people find you naomi so you can um Check out my website and connect to me there, which is Naomi Kramer Devi. So N A O M I P R E M A D E V I dot com. So that's one way. Or we're going to put it in the comments down below this video, wherever you're watching. It'll be somewhere around there as well, so you can click on it there. Mm -hmm. uh, but yes, Naomi Kramer Devi. And then also Instagram, it's uh, the handle is Naomi Primadivi. And then also um, Facebook, um, Naomi Primadivi Tantra is the, the one to look for. So you can find me there, see what I'm up to. <laughs> and yeah, I'm happy to, to be here of support to you if you want and need it. And, and, and I hope we can come back and, and maybe do some more specific talks about some yeah, things about yeah, specific yeah. topics because, yeah. you know, we kind of jumped around here, talked about a whole bunch of different things because the idea is to wake you up, right? This is your wake-up call for the week, and we want to wake you up to conscious relating to really enhance your relationships because relationships are what? The spice of life, exactly. right? Exactly. Same as variety. So you got to have some variety in your relationships too. And it's just, you know, if we're not happy in our relationships, our life generally kind of sucks, right? If you're not happy in your relationships, yeah. you're, you don't show up as your best self. And I know because I've experienced that. I'm speaking from experience. Mm -hmm. So it's really important to master the art and the beauty of conscious relating so that you can really live a fulfilled, joyous, purposeful life in a way that, you know, most people could imagine for themselves mm -hmm. and we are all entitled to that we all deserve it Absolutely. right mm, yeah awesome sounds good <laughs> great well naomi thank you very much for for coming out this morning and, and being here in person it's always a pleasure thank you very much for watching if you have any questions comments put them down you know if you're watching live put them on the side other than that it's down here on youtube wherever you're going to watch this video uh feel free to reach out your wake up call dot ca here in Vancouver, British Columbia. It's a beautiful day, July 20th, 2020. There's some interesting numbers there. 7 20 2020. Cool. Auspicious. Yeah. But in, until next time, folks, thank you so much. Stay well, stay healthy, stay happy, and live your best life. Take care.